Hello. So this is going to be an online video to assist you with going through the Hodgkin and Huxley experiments that we're going to use to try to better understand both resting memory potential and action potential. So this is part of um, our online lab week nine. And you guys can do this anytime that fits within your schedules. So you don't necessarily have to do it on Tuesday, but you will have a post lab quiz over these concepts. And you will want to make sure that you are prepared to take that post lab quiz by the time the weekend rolls around. So don't put this off too long and I'm putting it out a little bit early so that you guys can fit this into your schedule. So this is something that the instructions are written out in our lab supplement so that you can follow along and figure out how to run this program. In content on Brightspace, under lab documents and informations folder, you will find a link for the HH SIM program, Hodgkin and Huxley SIM program. And you're going to want to download that to your computer. Um, you can also simply Google HH SIM um, and get to the main page. So if you have an Apple device, you will need a different file than if you have a normal PC that you're working on. And I'm not sure that this would work on a tablet um, or a Chromebook per se. So if you're wor working off of one of those, um, this video will help you because I'm going to go through it as well with you so that you can watch and see what happens. So whether you choose to use the program on your own or whether you choose to just follow along here, that's sort of up to you. So um, to start with, HH Sim, the Hodgkin and Huxley Sim, is a simulation that replicates research that was done in 1939. Um, and to be honest, I can't remember if the Peace Prize, my guess is the Peace Prize was not um, issued in 1939 since the research was done in 1939, right? It takes a little bit of time to sort of see what sort of major changes um, come about from this sort of research. So these two gentlemen were working together and they were using very large axons, giant axons out of squids to be able to learn about signaling within the nervous system cells. And so they worked together in their labs. These are British um, scientists who ultimately did end up winning the Nobel Peace Prize due to uh, their contributions to science. And you may remember from earlier in this term that we also looked at um, a female scientist who worked with uh, Dr. Huxley here and was able to describe the sliding filament theory from our muscle chapter. Um, so the gentleman on the left is Andrew Huxley and the gentleman on the right is Andrew, no, sorry, Alan Hodgkin. And so they both were relatively brilliant in and of their own rights, but um, really were able to make some pretty amazing contributions to science. So what I want to do um, to take you through this lab um, virtually is I want to do a segment that I have with um, some cutouts because you know me. I like to cut things out and make them work. So I'm going to go through and give you some um, general descriptions of what is going on with the cell. Then we're going to open up the program and we're going to work through the program. Um, and you can pause the video to be able to assess or consider or look at the data that is coming through. OK, so this is going to be designed for you to pause at times so that you can draw conclusions. Or if you're working through it on your own, of course, um, you won't have to pause yourself. We are going to work out of the lab supplement this week. So you do need your week nine Hodgkin and Huxley supplement. There are some back or there is some background information in here. And so I think it would be useful if you could pause the video now and read through the background information that talks about resting memory potential and action potential. And also to read through the introduction at the beginning of the next page that tells us roughly how to run the program. What I'm going to do now is take you over to a screen and we're going to walk through what's going on for resting membrane potential and for action potentials. Then, once we have an idea of what 
should be happening inside the cell, we're going to use the program and use graphing out data to give us evidence of changes that are taking place and to draw some conclusions. So we're going to basically revisit some of what these two Nobel Peace Prize winners were able to do in 1939 in the way of science. Okay, so for part two of this, before we get to the actual lab portion where we go through the simulation program, I want to introduce some ideas here to you that I think will be important to understanding what's going on. And so we're going to do a little review of what we need to know about a cell. And what I'm going to do here is kind of organize my channels. So I've got my purple channels and I have two that are voltage gated sodium channels and one that's a passive gated sodium channels. Now this is not the actual number of channels which you will see in the simulation, but rather to represent the idea that we have a lot of voltage gated channels and a few passive channels. And then over here are the potassium channels. You'll see one voltage gated channel and two passive channels. Just again to give us the idea that we have relatively more passive channels that are for the potassium compared to the sodium and more voltage gated channels for the sodium compared to the potassium. Now if we're looking at a cell and we're considering the cell at rest, the cell is negatively charged on the inside and positively charged on the outside. And the electrolytes are not evenly distributed. They are not at equilibrium. Rather, you have potassium, which is noted with the K plus, hanging out by the negative charge. And that electrical um, charge potential, that electrical gradient is what's keeping the sodium on the in, or sorry, the potassium on the inside of the cell. The sodium is on the outside of the cell, and we have more sodium on the outside. Now, this isn't 100% correct because we really do have a little bit of sodium on the inside of the cell, and there is a little bit of potassium outside of the cell as well. So when we look at relative abundance, the majority of the sodium is outside of the cell, and the majority of potassium is inside the cell. If I'm considering things at resting membrane potential, I need to consider them with my passive potassium channels and my passive sodium channels. So these are leaky channels. These are facilitated channels that are always open, always allowing the molecules to move. So because I have a lot of passive potassium channels, if I were to do something like eat a meal that was rich in potassium, those potassium molecules would enter into my blood, that would increase the concentration outside of the cell, and because of these leaky channels, they would move inside that shell channel and navigate towards the negative charge on the inside of the cell. And recall that the negative charge on the inside of the cell is largely related to all of the negative proteins on the inside of the cell. So most electrical cells carry this significant electrical charge. And when I say by most electrical cells, that holds true for every cell that isn't currently being activated. So all cells at rest have that negative charge on the inside and the positive charge on the outside. So if I was just looking at this and I was looking at what a cell looked like at resting membrane potential, you would want to make notes of this, not the channels up above. Make note of this, that the majority of potassium is inside the cell and the majority of sodium is outside of the cell. This is what we know as resting membrane potential. Now when it comes time to signal the cell, it turns out that we start to utilize these other channels. And I'm going to mix this up a little bit because really they're all the way around the cell. And so now I've added in, not only do I have my passive channels that are always there, but I also have these gated channels. Now note something, because we're going to talk about this in greater detail in class. The sodium channel has an active gate and an inactive gate. So the active gate is the outer gate, and the inner gate is called an inactive gate because it inactivates this channel. The voltage-gated potassium channel is more simple. There's just a single gate there. Okay, so what's going to happen? If an action potential comes down the line, perhaps signaling at the neuromuscular junction or by neurotransmitter release on the dendrites of a nerve, this is going to engage voltage-gated channels. And the voltage-gated channels that are going to respond are the voltage-gated sodium channels. They respond by opening up at threshold. So when threshold is hit, these channels 
open up. The activation gate opens up. Now, the way this cell is set up, there is a chemical gradient. Sodium wants to move to the inside. And there's also an electrical gradient. Sodium wants to move to the inside. Now, even at rest, sodium does move inside a little bit through that passive channel over there. But there's a sodium potassium pump that works 100% of the time. And as soon as sodium sneaks in, the sodium potassium pump kicks it right back out. Now, when an action potential is generated and we open these voltage gated channels, we overwhelm the sodium potassium pump. And so what happens is all of these sodiums are gonna navigate through these channels and we're gonna start to load the inside of the cell with a whole lot of sodium, okay? Now take note, most of the sodium's going in, okay? And what that means now is they've moved down their concentration gradient and they move down the electrical gradient to the negative charge. And what happens when I add all of that sodium with all of the potassium that's already inside the cell, that changes the charge on the inside of the cell and the inside of the cell becomes positively charged. We call that depolarization. So as depolarization occurs, it occurs because the sodium rushes in through voltage gated sodium channels to the interior of the cell. All the sodium molecules with the combination of all of the potassium molecules changes the charge on the inside of the cell to positive. The outside of the cell temporarily becomes negative. Now, once we hit a positive potential, once we are positive on the inside, that triggers this channel over here to open up and the voltage gated potassium channel opens up its gate. And now I have an electrical potential for potassium to move out because it's negative outside. And I have very few potassium outside the cell. So I also have a chemical gradient for potassium to move outside the cell. The combined action of the passive channels and the voltage channels allow potassium from the inside of the cell to rapidly navigate to the exterior of the cell. And as it goes out, what's going to happen is a charge differential because as the potassium leaves, it takes a large number of the positive charges with it. There's one more. Let's kick him out of the cell as well. And so now I have more sodium inside than outside. And because the potassium left, this flips the charge again. So the outside of the cell becomes positive again, and the inside of the cell becomes negative again. This is called repolarization. Now, in many ways, this is similar to resting membrane potential, but remember with resting membrane potential, the potassium was inside of the cell and the sodium was outside of the cell. So at repolarization, I reestablish the charge, my positive and negative charge, but my electrolytes are all over the place. They are in the wrong location. So that sodium potassium pump that I mentioned that was always working, always spinning, always going, is gonna kick into motion there and it's going to exchange sodium for potassium. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get the exchange of sodium and potassium molecules sort of simultaneously until I load the interior of the cell back with the potassium and I kick the sodium back out, okay? Now, as this is going on, the sodium gates here, this inactivation gate is gonna be closed, okay? And that's gonna prevent sodium from coming right back in. So as the sodium potassium pump, an ATP driven pump is moving those sodium molecules out, this inactivation gate is closed to prevent any additional sodium from coming in and we are able then to put our potassium back on the inside. So our sodium potassium pump is working to help establish resting membrane potential. And here we're back at resting membrane potential. At resting membrane potential, the cell is negative on the inside and positive on the outside. And there's more potassium on the inside of the cell and more sodium on the outside of the cell. So the process by which these electrolytes get rearranged across the membrane is known as the refractory period and much of this takes place in the after potential and that's what we're going to investigate in class today so a couple of important notes to pay attention to here the resting membrane potential is as it's set up here more potassium on the inside more sodium on the outside lots of passive channels allowing movement of potassium and very few active potassium channels because there's so few sodium channels 
that means most of the sodium is on the outside because what is not represented in this illustration is the sodium potassium pump that is working 100% of the time, every day of your life, all the time. And the only way to get an action potential is to overwhelm the sodium potassium pump. And we do that by opening these voltage gated channels. When we open those voltage gated channels, the concentration gradient to enter the cell from high sodium to low sodium is there. And we have the electrical charge of high positives to negatives. And that drives all of the sodium inside for depolarization. That then depolarization opens the voltage gated potassium channel. And now the potassium cells are gonna, or ions are gonna leave through the voltage gated channel as well as passive channels. And you'll get potassium on the outside of the cell and sodium on the inside of the cell. And that my friends is what we call repolarization. So really critical idea to go forward into the lab more important on your next exam is to understand how the electrolytes and the channels are working together in a coordinated fashion to be able to create the resting membrane potential and then action potentials when called upon. So let's leave this model here and let's jump over into the simulation and let's start working with these ideas in graphical form. Okay, so now that you've had a little bit of time to review the introductory information in the lab supplement, and we've had a moment to review the physiology of what's going on inside electrically excitable cells during the action potential and during the action potential. It's time to start working with the HH Sim program. So recall, this is, uh, you can either Google and pull this program up, or you can also get it off of the lab documents and information folder under content in Brightspace. When you get it downloaded and you open it up and install it, this is the main page that's going to come up. And this program is amazing. There's so many different things that we can potentially do with it. But our goal is going to be looking at resting membrane potential and action potential. So we're gonna start with part A of the lab, um, experiment one, and we're gonna start by altering extracellular ion concentration with and, and then using the channels that already exist within the cell as an indicator of what will happen to resting membrane potential. Now, it's really important when we're looking at resting membrane potential to really only be looking at leaky channels or passive channels, okay? So these are the channels that would allow for the electrolytes to be able to move back and forth, the ions to move back and forth. To give you a basic introduction to this program, the top graph here, with the lines on the horizontal and vertical axis is going to show us the membrane voltage. So we'll be watching this to show us changes in the resting membrane potential. And the red line is going to show us those voltage changes. The blue line is going to show us when we stimulate the cell. Okay. And so to do that, down in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a stimulate one button and a stim two button. And so we're going to be utilizing, utilizing those stimulate buttons to be able to get responses in the cell. So we'll get a blurb from the blue line when we hit the stimulate button. And then we'll watch to see what happens with the red line as an indicator. Okay. Um, you can also zoom in and zoom out. There are also these other values here in the uh, yellow, green, and cyan colors. So we'll be changing some of those values as well. And the reason that these are different colors, if you look at the lower graph, you'll see M is represented in yellow, H is represented in green, and N is represented in blue. So we can change what we want those things to mean. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to open up this membrane channel. So up on top, I'm going to click the membrane channel. And then I like to simply move it to the side of my screen so that it sits next to my graph. And I can manipulate features within that rather than closing it and opening it every time. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up the channels button. And I'm going to bring that over as well so that I have both of the two windows that I'm going to be manipulating variables on open to get or to start. So what we're going to do for experiment one, where we're altering electrolytes, we're altering the ions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and for both the yellow and the blue, I'm sorry, yellow and the green, I'm going to click blank. Okay. And so you can see that actually removed it from the lower graph. So we're not actually going to utilize any data from those particular things. We're going to smooth those to blank. And then we're going to go to the cyan color and we're going to go to I leak. 
um, there he is, I leak. Okay, and so what this is going to do is show us the electrolytes that are leaking. And we're going to get to be able to see the movement of those cells as they leak. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do for this too is we have to set a couple of other things over here. So if we look in the channels box, you're going to see that there are passive channels and then fast channels. So the passive channels are the leaky channels that we've been talking about, and these fast channels are voltage gated channels that respond quickly when called upon. Now our goal in this first exercise is to simply look at resting membrane potential. So I don't want the cell to respond with an action potential. So I'm going to deselect both of those pink boxes so that I only have my passive channels. And we'll have passive channels for sodium, passive, cha passive channels for potassium, and then also passive channels for chloride. We don't really spend a lot of time talking about chloride, but chloride is like my obnoxious little brother who loves to follow me around. So if you think of sodium as the older sibling, chloride as the younger sibling that wants to go where sodium wants to go. So we're going to leave those channels on for now. Okay, so this will have a set up to be able to look at resting membrane potential. And so what we're doing then is simply looking at how does the voltage of the membrane change based on the things that we're about to do with it. And so we're only looking at the leaky channels. We're looking at the cell at rest. We are not engaging any of those active channels. Okay, um, so what we're going to do now that we've got these run is we're going to hit the stimulate button and I'm going to hit it again. And you'll notice you get a little stimulate and then it kind of comes back. This right here is going to become our baseline. So by clicking on the red graph, you remember I said if I click on the stimulate button, it's going to give me a blurb on the dark blue here to show me where I stimulated. And then the red is going to show me what happens with my voltage. And so if you look right where I clicked and down here in this voltage box, this is saying, hey, your resting membrane potential right now is sitting at about negative 47 millivolts. Now, if I select over here, it's going to be slightly different, negative 48.5. Roughly, right, we just want a baseline for roughly what's happening here. Okay, so that gives us our introduction or our baseline that we want to come about. So you're going to find the box on your um, lab supplement that says, what is the resting membrane potential? And you're going to write down negative 48.5 or negative 47. We're going to use that area as our baseline to go forward with. So as we manipulate the variables from this point out, we're comparing them. Did it get more negative? Did it go down to negative 60 or negative 80? Or did it get more positive? Did it go up to negative 20 or did it hit zero? So what are the trends of what's happening with the resting membrane potential? Okay, so now that we have our control, I'm going to clear this out so that our data is flat lined and again I'll click on it just so you can see so now it's saying okay our resting membrane potential here is negative 47.4 so in the same vicinity of uh, what we clicked on on the last screen and what we're going to do is we're going to work to part B now part B says click on the C out box okay so in this membrane box here here are my electrolytes, my sodium, I got my potassium, I have my chloride and at the top I have concentration inside the cell and concentration outside of the cell. Now we can alter concentration outside of the cell. We have to rely on channels to create changes inside the cell. So for us, we're going to focus on changing values over here in the concentration or C outside of the cell to make our changes. And so we're going to start with potassium and we're going to start by simply changing the amount of potassium outside of the cell to 30. And then I'm going to hit the enter button. And I'm going to come over here and click on this to see what happened. And so now I'm at negative 45.1. If I come over here and I alter this to, it says now keep doing this sequentially to 50. So 250, I'm going to hit the enter button. Now at 50, the resting membrane potential is at negative 40.6. Okay. And next is to go up to 100. And so let's go to 100. So we're increasing the concentration of the potassium outside of the cell. Hit the enter button and we climb yet again to a value of roughly negative 34.8. Okay, so what we're seeing in the trend here is that as I put potassium outside of the cell, the membrane voltage is changing and it's becoming more positive 
on the interior. Okay, so it's going to be important to us then anytime that we get closer to threshold, we call it a hypopolarization. And anytime we get further away from threshold, we become hyperpolarized, meaning it would take even more energy to get to threshold. So based on this trend in part B here, increase in extracellular potassium concentrations, I would like you to pause the video for a minute and answer the questions. What do you call this type of change in the membrane potential? So it's either a hyperpolarization or a hypopolarization. And then can you answer the question based on what we did earlier as to why changing extracellular potassium has an, this effect? Why do we see this increase? And just to really, really increase it, I'm going to up this to 400 real quick. Oh, it maxed out at 100. It just won't let me do more than 100. Okay, so you're going to write down your trend and you're going to try to draw conclusions on why you see this. Why did that happen? So if you've unpaused the video now, we're moving on to decreasing the potassium levels. And so we could almost predict right now that if increasing potassium caused this to go into a state of um, getting closer to threshold, right, becoming less negative, that if we go and change the values of potassium to less potassium, we would expect the opposite reaction. So I'm going to set us back to 20, and you're going to see a decline there. So we should be back relative at the negative 47. So remember, we were at negative 47.4 to begin by going back to the initial 20. And you can do that by simply hitting the reset button or changing the value back to 20. And we get to a negative um, 46, negative 40, uh, negative 47. So we're back to that resting membrane potential. Now what we're going to do is we're going to drop this. I'm going to go to 15 and hit enter. I'm going to go to 10 and hit enter. I'm going to go to 5 and hit enter. And so if we go, so here was where we went to 15. It went down to negative 49.6. At negative 10, we dropped to negative 52.9. And at negative or at 5 milliequivalents outside the cell, we dropped to negative 58.8, okay? So what we're going to do here um, is do exactly what you did for Part B. So now in the lab supplement C, decreasing extracellular potassium, you are then going to report what kind of change is this into resting membrane potential. So it's going to be opposite of what you wrote above. So if you wrote hyperpolarize above, then you would write hypopolarize below or vice versa, okay? And remember, to hyperpolarize means to get further away from threshold, and to hypopolarize means to get closer to threshold. And then again, while you're paused, take a moment to try to describe why changing the extracellular potassium is having this net effect. Now that you've had a moment to record your results, we're going to reset these values, this time by hitting the reset button. I'm also going to clear the data out, and we're going to move into altering the sodium levels. So we're going to alter the sodium concentration outside the cell. And if you look at this, you'll see sort of at, at a cell's basics, it's going to have less potassium outside of the cell, and it has more sodium outside the cell. So just under natural circumstances, we expect to find more sodium present outside of the cell. So we're going to work on Part D, increasing extracellular sodium. And what we're going to do is we're simply going to increase those sodium levels, and again, watch the trend of what happens. So I hit uh, 500, type 500 in, and then hit the enter button, and it's negative 47.9 from negative 48.3. If I alter it to 600, again, not very much of a change. The graph is staying relatively stable, negative 47.6. Let's say we go up to 700, hit enter again, and we get negative 47.2. So again, I'm going to take a moment. Um, this is probably on either the bottom of page 59 or the very top of page 60 for you. Um, so take a moment to write down what sort of effect you're seeing here. Are you seeing a big effect or is it a negligible effect? And why is that? 
why are we not seeing a like graph to what we saw with the potassium? Take a moment and pause the video and record your answers. Fabulous. So now that you have those answers recorded for B, the next thing you're going to do or we're going to do is we're going to change this and we're going to decrease the sodium level. So I'm going to hit the reset button again um, and that's going to hopefully clear us out and get us back to negative 47.5 as a resting membrane potential. And now I'm going to drop from 40 to 440 to maybe 400. The new value by clicking on the line is negative 47.7. Let's drop down to 300 millimolar extracellular. We are now at 48.1. Go to 200. We are at negative 49.6. And if I drop to 100, we go to negative 51.9. So again, I'm going to give you a few minutes here to describe what the effect of decreasing sodium on the resting membrane potential is. Is it a hypopolarization, a hyperpolarization? Is it negligible? Um, and why? Why are we seeing a different response with sodium compared to what we were able to see in the way of potassium? Sensational. So now that you have all your notes, it's time to do a little reflection over what we were able to see. So we were manipulating the amount of electrolytes that was found outside of the cell. And what we found is that some of those electrolytes carrying those positive charges were able to either enter the cell or exit the cell. Those positive charges then had an influence on the charge on the inside of the cell. So if we were able to get positive ions to move inside of the cell, then we were able to see a significant change on the graph, okay? So there are two completion questions for this first part of this exercise. The first completion question is, what can you say regarding the importance of potassium and sodium in resting membrane potentials? Now, this is gonna be a huge idea. You're gonna see it on your final exam. So make sure that you look between changing sodium amounts and changing potassium amounts and which one and there's only one which one has a significant effect on resting membrane potential the second question well i should say part of that second question is then which of the ions is most important so how do you characterize the way that these work these two electrolytes impact resting membrane potential, and then which one electrolyte is the most influential to resting membrane potential? Please pause the video and record your answers. Okay, now that we've taken a moment to consider what happens if the electrolytes are altered, which can be done by giving a person an IV, People can consume products that are high in sodium or high in potassium, and they can ultimately end up influencing their resting membrane potential. Outside of that, cells also can alter their resting membrane potential by changing the number of passive channels that they have. And so what we're going to do in this next phase is to look at the channel. So I'm going to reset the membrane so that the electrolytes are back to the physiological normal levels. And I'm gonna clear out the data on our graph. And again, that'll give us a general baseline of this time negative 48.1, right? So we're fluctuating somewhere between negative 47 and negative 48.5. That's sort of our standard uh, resting membrane potential. So now we're gonna do resting membrane experiment two. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna alter the permeability. So that's gonna be something that we need to do down here in the channels button, right? And so what we want to do is either increase the number of channels or decrease the number of channels that are present in the membrane. So again, A is the control. So you want to click your resting membrane potential just like we did and find out what value we're comparing against. So again, we're, we're working off of roughly negative 47 to negative 48. Um, and then we're going to alter these channels. And this time, anytime we alter these channels, if I hit this reset button, 
Um, oh, they fixed it. Fabulous. Normally, if you hit the reset button, the pink channels come back on, but we want those pink channels to remain off for this because we're really only looking at those leaky passive channels and how that's influencing the resting membrane potential. Now, this is a shorter experiment because we are either going to increase permeability to sodium by adding sodium channels, or we're going to increase permeability to potassium by altering the potassium channels. So part B in experiment two on resting membrane potential is to increase membrane permeability to potassium. So I'm going to focus on the passive GK uh, uh, channel here, and it says the control is 0 0.07. We're going to alter this value, and we're going to change it to 0.25, and I'm going to hit the enter button, and then I'm going to change it to 0 0.50, hit the enter button, and again, alter it to 0.75 and hit the enter button. So when we dropped or, or um, increased the permeability to potassium, what we found was initially a drop to negative 59.1. Potassium was leaving the cell. It then dropped to negative 64.2 and then negative 66. So we're seeing what is the word for this? What is the trend for when the, the membrane potential gets further away from threshold? Okay, so you're going to start here, pause the video, and answer the next two questions in the supplement. What effect does increasing permeability to potassium have on the resting membrane potential? And why does it have this effect? What's going on here that creates this uh, reaction? Take a moment to pause the video and we'll continue when you have your notes recorded. Welcome back. I'm glad you got your ideas down on pen and paper. And now we're going to return the settings to normal so that our passive potassium channels are back to their base level of 0 0.07. I'm also going to clear out the graph by hitting the clear button. And I'm going to do it one more time because we just watched that um, membrane recover from what we did with the passive channel. So here we are. Resting membrane potential, negative 48.1. Okay, so there's our baseline again. And the goal at this time is to change the passive channels. So the passive channels here, we have starting with negative 0.2. So if you look at this, even in you're comparing the value between the sodium channel and the potassium channel, you can see that there are five hundredths more channels in the, of potassium than there are of sodium. There's just not as many leaky passive sodium channels. Okay, so what do you think that's going to mean? If we have fewer sodium channels at normal, at physiological normal, and I start to add sodium channels, what's going to happen? So we're going to start by altering this value, and we're going to go from 0.026 to 0.15. I'm going to hit the enter button. Hot diggity dog. Did you guys see that? Okay, we're up to negative 8.35 millivolts. Like we jumped legitimately 40 millivolts closer to threshold, closer to zero. Okay, so if we continue to increase that permeability, as it states in our handout, we go to 30. And from 30, we go to 45. And from 45, we go to 60, and then from 60, we're going to go to 75. Do we really need to do this? Probably not, because you should be able to see the amazing trend that's developing here. So by initially increasing to 0.15, we ended up at negative 3.5. As we navigated to 3.30, we get to 10.7 millivolts, so I'm full on into the positive side of things now, right? This cell is no longer negatively charged. It is into the positive charge. And then as you continue, we get 20.8, 26.9, and 31.1. Okay, so which of these two is bigger? 
So what we're going to do now is, again, pause the video while you take a moment to describe what the effect of increasing permeability of sodium has to resting membrane potential. Again, you're going to use the term hypopolarized or hyperpolarized. And you can, at this point, then say slight or great as descriptive terms to suggest what sort of trends you're seeing with this data. And then also, I'm curious, can you explain why? By increasing the number of sodium channels, the inside of the cell becomes so positive. Take a moment and pause yourselves now, and then we will move on to the next activity. One last thought before we leave this section on resting membrane potential. I'm curious if you guys can explain to me or can identify which electrolyte is crucial to control because it has a huge effect on resting membrane potential and which channels can we increase activity at and see significant impacts on the resting membrane potential. This idea is going to show up on your final exam. You will need to be able to tell me which electrolyte has the greatest impact on resting membrane potential and changes to permeability of what electron, electrolyte, has the greatest impact on resting membrane permeability. Okay, guys, fabulous work so far. We're halfway there. We have investigated ideas rel uh, related to the resting membrane potential, which is a cell at rest. It's not doing anything. And so we looked in the last segment at the electrolyte that was most important to resting membrane potential, the one that had the ability to move naturally on its own and have a significant effect. And then also looked at the channels of the membrane and look to see if we were able to change permeability to one ion, which ion would have the greatest effect in changes of membrane permeability, so changes in the channel. So what we're going to do here is we're going to reset our program because now we want to start investigating action potentials. And so this has to do with the way that a cell is signaled and what happens in response by the cell during those signaling processes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to our channels and we're going to reset those channels and we are now going to turn on the fast sodium channel. Um, and just to double check, let's see here. And I think we want the delayed recidifier on as well. So we're going to turn those two channels back on. The other thing that we're going to do, so we've reset our electrolytes. Um, and if you notice, just by hitting enter, all of a sudden this graph did some interesting things. Now we have this interesting up and down behavior, and that is the characteristics that we're looking for as an indicator of an action potential. So in resting membrane potential, we were just looking at trends. Did the resting membrane potential, did the line get closer to threshold or further away from threshold? But now we're going to be looking for action potentials and the things that create those action potentials. So I'm going to close the membrane channel, and I'm actually going to open the stimuli box. And I'm going to move the stimulus box off to the side of my graph so that I have it available to me as well. And at one point, we'll actually also work with this drugs box over here. I'm going to clear out all of the data and do it just a couple of times just to make sure that anything that was residual from our resting membrane potentials is going to disappear at this point. Remember, we also changed those colored boxes at the bottom left-hand corner, and we need to make some changes to those boxes for the resting membrane potential. What we're going to do is we're going to take the yellow one, and we're going to select M. And what M actually means is it's the movement of sodium. And then we're going to do the same thing for green, and we're going to change that to H. And then we're going to change away from the iLeak channel. We didn't really pay much attention to that in the last module. That's okay. We're going to change this back to N. Okay. And so what this is going to do is allow us to see the movement of the electrolytes during the action potentials that we're able to create. Okay. So also following along in the supplement, it says make sure in your channels window um, that you reset all of the values. Um, and that includes turning on the pink channels so that we can have these fast reactions in regards to the action potential. 
Um, that way we can also change our stimulate one, stimulate two buttons, which will be in this st stimulus window. So we can make some um, conclusions, draw some conclusions from that information. And we can close the channels box because we are not going to use that anymore at this point. Not but we're now that we're starting the action potential. Now, if I do look in the stimulus one, there's two vertical bars. So look at the top. You've got one vertical bar here and one vertical bar here. These are controlling the stimulate one button. Down below controls the stimulate two button. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start with the vertical bar on the left. That's this one here. And we're going to drop that down to one. Okay. Actually, we're going to drop that down to zero is how we're going to start. And then we're going to start to increase this over time. So this information is at the bottom of page 61 to the top of page 62 in your supplement if you're looking for a page number to figure out where we are. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the creating an action potential experiment. Our channels are reset. Our electrolytes are back to normal. And we've changed the values in the bottom left so that the yellow, green, and blue are M, H, and N. And so they're going to show us what's happening with our electrolytes and the conductance or the movement of those electrolytes. So what I'm going to do with this zero here is then come over and hit the stimulate one button. And of course, nothing happens because we're at zero. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to change that stimulus button to five. And now when I hit stimulate, there is on the blue line an indicator of the stimulus. When the stimulus was applied, we get the characteristic graph of an action potential. So here we have the local potential building to threshold. At threshold, we get the depolarization, which is the movement up and the repolarization, which is the movement down. A standard action potential also has a hyperpolarization phase, an after potential, and so we see that dip in the graph here and then back to normal. So here is my resting membrane potential at negative 61, and here is my resting membrane potential at negative 62. Now this value is a little bit different than what we looked at in the resting membrane potential because we disengaged those active channels. So resting membrane potential in organisms does tend to be on the end of a negative 70 to a negative 90 millivolts, depending upon the organism that we're looking at. Okay, so there's my first stimulus at five. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to increase the stimulus to 10. Hit stimulate one. You may notice that the first stimulate at 5 versus stimulate at 10, this is showing a larger stimulus. And we're going to continue to do this. Oh, sorry. We're going to continue to do this, and you're just going to watch the trend. Here it is at 15. Here we are at 20. Twenty-five, thirty. So as you're watching this, there's two things to be thinking. What is happening to the height of the blue stimulus bar? And the red shows the action potential. What's happening to the action potential as I add more and more stimulus? In the stimulate bar. Now, without just telling you the answer and allowing you to use those beautiful brains that we are trying to develop some amazing critical thinking skills in, some awesome thinking power, I want you to take a moment and review this data, okay? Look at the peak of the red for the action potentials and look at the blue to show us how much stimuli we are applying, okay? And you're going to answer the question at the end of this after we scroll back and forth as to what is the effect on resting membrane potential and why. Sorry, wrong question. What does this experiment indicate about how action potentials are produced, okay? So just to review, 
be watching the trend in the red, which is showing the action potential, versus the blue in the top graph that is showing the amount of stimuli. So increasing stimuli. You need to ask yourself, do you see any change in the action potential as stimuli strength is increased? Take a moment and pause the video and record your answer. Sweet. So in our book, in our nervous system chapter, there is information about events that lead to an action potential and then what happens once threshold has been met. So if you're still a little unsure about your answer for this first part, what does this experiment indicate? Note that the peaks of all of the red are roughly at the same place. And maybe take a moment to review that chapter. Okay, so the next part of our action potential investigation is going to be to look at um, the effect of stimulus strength. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over to our stimulus window and we're going to reset that stimulus window so it goes back to normal. And we're going to clear the data out. And again, I like to click this a couple of times just to make sure I get back to my base and I've gotten everything cleared out. So we're at negative 62.8, okay? So what we're going to do here is run an action potential and we're going to now pay attention to what the graph is showing us in the, the bottom segment here. Okay, So with the blue and the yellow and the green lines in the lower graph. So I'm going to hit stimulate. We should see the action potential. I'm going to do it one more time just so we have an extra one to look at. So we should be able to see the action potential above, but now we're going to be paying attention to what happens to the cyan, which is the blue, and the sodium, which is the yellow. And so you're going to take a moment to draw some conclusions here as well. So can you write down some notes on what the differences are of the potassium and the sodium conductance along the action potential? Okay. And so just train your eye right here, follow this yellow, and if you see the yellow starts to go up here, and if I take my mouse up, it correlates on the action potential with the upward trend of the action potential. And if you look at the peak movement of sodium here, it aligns with the peak movement of the action potential. Okay, And then the sodium level drops. So you watch the trend of it dropping, and if you click at where it drops, you'll also find that it correlates with the back side of the action potential. Now take a moment and look at the cyan level layer, okay? And if you look at where the cyan level starts to increase, that movement of potassium begins to happen. It's in line with the peak of the action potential. So what does that tell you about when the potassium is moving? And then if you look at the peak here where most potassium is moving and you go up, it aligns with the downward trend on the graph. So what does that tell you about when the sodium is moving and when the potassium is moving during the action potential? Okay. And then the follow-up question is, what is this conductance, these changes between sodium moving first and potassium moving second? Why does the conductance change occur when it does? And what do these changes mean with respect to the graph we see, the formation of the action potential? And can you recall the terms for this, okay, which isn't written down there, but there are some terms for the front side of the action potential versus the back side. Take a moment and pause the video and make your notes. Okay, so now that you are aware that action potentials are all or nothing, now that you are aware that the depolarization phase of an action potential occurs because sodium is moving, and the back side of the action potential occurs because the potassium is moving, now we want to look at 
what happens if we alter the movement of these two electrolytes? What happens if we block them? One of the ways that we very typically block the movement of electrolytes is by the introduction of drugs. And we have drugs that are synthetically based off of natural compounds. And there are also a number of not natural compounds that can also dramatically impact the way that action potentials are created. Um, some of you are aware that there are toxic mushrooms that can start, stop your heart, right? That's an example of a drug that would impact your um, ability to conduct electricity. It would block the movement of these electrolytes. So what we're going to do is we're going to click over for part, um, really it's C and D, action potential TPX effects and action potential TEA effects. We're going to go into this drug window here. So we're going to open this up. And this drug window here has both of the two drugs that we're going to use. And there's some notes in here. So the TTX, which stands for tetrodotoxin, which is the pufferfish toxin. So this is a toxin that is present in the pufferfish. And some cultures enjoy eating puffer fish, but the chefs have to be specially trained to make sure that they don't nick a gland releasing tetrodotoxin into the puffer fish. Every time you eat puffer fish, you're sort of playing a little bit of a game of Russian roulette with whether or not you're going to release or consume some of this toxin. It's going to have potentially lethal effects on your body. And so as you can see right here, uh, tetrodotoxin is going to inhibit sodium current, sodium conductance. So we can almost predict what we're going to see as an impact if I block sodium movement. The other drug that we're going to use is triethyl ammonium, and triethyl ammonium works to interfere with potassium's movement. So those are the two drugs that we're going to play with. So what we're going to do is we're going to click back to our stimulus window and reset it just to make sure that we are reset. And we are going to clear out our data again because it's always good to start with a fresh graph. And I'm going to hit stimulate so that we have one action potential with which to compare to. So now we're going to look at um, uh, the amount of tetrodotoxin um, inhibition to the cell. And we're going to do this um, by first going to 100%. So what if you get a full dose of this particular drug? Okay, so I'm going to hit 100% and then I'm going to hit the stimulate button. Okay, so here is the stimulate, right, where the blue bar on the top graph shows us when we stimulated the cell. And this was the response of the cell. Okay, and what that means is, and if you look at down here, potassium didn't really change, but look at the green sodium, or sorry, the yellow sodium. You see a little movement of sodium and then it's blocked and it goes back to normal. And so the action potential never hits threshold. We never get the full graph because of this blockage of the sodium movement. So the other thing to do here is to actually go back into the drug and change it to 50% inhibition, 50% concentration and see what happens. And so then here we are looking at, and I'm going to shift the graph a little bit so we can see back to our other data as well. Um, so here is at 50% conductance, you were able to get enough sodium movement that you hit, what's the magic value for an action potential? Threshold. So you hit threshold, and then you're able to get the action potential. So this drug prevents sodium movement. This would create, um, for example, something that we would call flaccid paralysis, where the muscle cells in the neuro nervous tissue is just not able to generate an action potential. It breaks down that action potential production um, from the get-go. Okay, so take a moment and pause the video and record some answers for this one under Action Potentials TTX Effects. The two questions to answer are, what do you think is the effect of tetrodotoxin? And why is there no potassium movement when tetrodotoxin is used? Okay, so now that we have our answers recorded for tetrodotoxin, I'm going to reset the values here and, of course, clear out my graph as normal to be able to get a baseline. I'm also going to hit stimulate one before I apply any of the drugs to give me that nice pretty action potential uh, to fall back on as a resource. Now I'm going to go over to my drugs box and I'm going to go to the triethylammonium, which it says inhibits the potassium current.
And so what we're going to do with this is we once again going to hit this thing with a 100% inhibition and I'm going to hit the stimulate button. What did you notice happened to the graph here? Okay, so this graph is going to be very different from tetrodotoxin. And I want you to take a moment and consider what happens with the yellow line for sodium below, what happens with the um, potassium line from below, and does the action potential return to normal? So you're going to pause the video again for a minute here, and you're going to write down some answers. What do you think the effect of TEA is? And what is the significance of a drug like TEA? Why would it be used? What would be the benefit to this particular drug? And you may also consider how is this impacting the action potential? Take a moment to pause, and then we'll move on to the final part of this particular exercise. Okay, just to be sick and twisted and because we can, let's reset these once again and clear out our graph and hit stimulate one to get a nice pretty action potential. Now, what if some sick and, sick and twisted individual actually applied both tetrodotoxin and triethylammonium? Consider this and ask yourself, what would you expect in the way of an action potential if both of these two drugs were applied simultaneously? I'm going to hit the stimulate button. Nothing happens. Why? Because in order for an action potential to take place, sodium has to move first and potassium then has to follow. So the action of the tetrodotoxin actually negates anything from TEA because we never get into a situation where we need that potassium to move. Now, how many of you have heard of antidotes, right? We do have antidotes to help cure and fix issues. So if we can catch pufferfish toxin in time, if we're able to identify pathologies soon enough and offer treatment, we can help reverse many of those effects. So right here in the drugs box, there's a button for a antidote. That antidote is called pronase, and this eliminates the sodium inactivation. So basically, it repairs the tetrodotoxin. So if I go ahead and hit stimulate now, oh, I'm still not getting something very pretty. Let's take away the TEA, and something's not working right. Okay, so what's supposed to be happening here is that the pronase uh, alters the tetrodotoxin. So let's get our normal action potential. Let's hit 100% dose of tetrodotoxin and hit the stimulate button. We don't see anything happen. And then when we put the pronase in, this should give us, eh, it should return to normal. Okay, well, we're going to blame it on computer issues. I mean, what would it be if we didn't have at least one computer issue? Okay. So now the last thing for us to do, which should be at the top of page 63 to midway down page 63, is action potentials and the refractory period. So the goal of looking at the refractory period is going to be to look at a bit of this period after the action potential, the after potential, as it's returning back to resting membrane. So before we do anything, we're going to go in and reset all of our drugs. We're going to clear out that window. We're also going to hit reset in our stimuli just in case anything was there that we don't want. Let's clear out our results once again and then hit our stimulate button to get a nice pretty action potential as sort of a baseline. Now remember the phases of the action potential. I have my resting membrane potential until I am stimulated. I get a local potential until I hit threshold. So I see kind of a, a slow increase here to the action potential. Once I hit threshold, it's all or nothing, baby. Boom, up sodium moves. Boom, potassium moves out. We go back down. And then I get this hook underneath known as the after potential. Now, cells can be stimulated in sequence, but there is a limit to how quickly they can respond. And that has to do with the refractory period. The refractory period is defined 
two ways. So you can go through a period of absolute refractory period where absolutely nothing, no way, no how, never, ever, 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 ever are you going to manage to get another action potential. That would be the absolute refractory period. We also get a zone called the relative refractory period, which is, well, we can potentially get another action potential, but it's going to take an intense stimuli to get us there. And if we look at or consider the idea, like, let's say thresholds at negative 40, just it's not. But let's use that as an example. When you're at resting membrane potential here, right, you have about negative 20. You have to, be, you have to move up about 20 to get to the uh threshold. If you look over here in the after potential, you're down here at negative 70. So now you actually have to move up by 30 to get to threshold. So in the relative refractory period, this is the period where it is possible to create or generate another action potential, but you have to put more energy into it to start before you can get that action potential to be created. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish up this exercise by running through the action potentials at um, top of page 63 at the very end of the section called action potentials refractory periods. So we've reset our drugs window, we've exited the drugs window, we've reset our results, and we've got our stimuli um, going here. And what we're going to do now is play with both of the vertical bars. Okay, so when I hit stimuli, I want to be able to get two stimuli in a sequence. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to start with your pulses about 10 seconds apart. Okay, so right there. So what you just saw was a change in the amount of time, and then I'm going to increase this bar here also to 10, so that I'm giving the same stimuli strength at the same time, but it's coming about 10 milliseconds apart. And so I'm going to start by hitting stimulate 1, and what you're getting is then two bars, right? Here's the first stimulus with an action potential and a second stimulus with the action potential. And so what that means is that we are not in a refractory period here. So we're going to go over to the stimulus, and we're going to drop that down to 9 milliseconds apart, and we're going to repeat the process. And we're going to do this now to 8. Note the action potentials are coming closer and closer together, so we are signaling the cell more rapidly in sequence. Going to 7. Okay, what did you notice right there? Okay, so at 8, we had two action potentials in sequence. That's right, 9, and then at 8, and then at 7, we were unable to get another action potential. Okay. All right, so that tells us that the refractory period, including both the absolute and relative refractory periods, the total refractory period takes about seven milliseconds. Okay, now I'm curious though, are we in the after potential or are we in the absolute refractory period? Now, to figure out if we're in the absolute refractory period versus the relative refractory period, what we need to do is alter the amount of juice that we are applying. So I'm moving the second vertical bar, and I'm going to shift that up to all the way to 100. So, like, if I stuck your finger into a light socket, could I get your muscles or your nervous tissue to respond a second time? Okay, and we're going to start at 7 because we know that's the end of the refractory period. We know that the refractory period at 8 milliseconds, 9 milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds is able to generate a second action potential. So what we want to do now is figure out to tease out the difference between the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. To do that, my first stimuli just has to hit threshold. The second stimuli needs to have enough energy in it to overcome the hyperpolarization and hit threshold. So what I've done is dramatically increase that by setting my second bar here to 100. Okay, so what we're going to do is hit the stimulate button here. Now look at those blue bars. Can you tell I hit this thing with a lot of juice? Look at the height differential there. So this is showing us that I am, in fact, releasing or utilizing more electricity to try to get a response, and I was able to get that response at 7 milliseconds. So now let's drop that to 6 and see if we are still able. So this tells me at 7 milliseconds, I am in the relative refractory period. 
at six, I still get two. So you answer to me, is it absolute refractory period or am I in relative refractory period? And then let's drop to five seconds. Again, is this relative or absolute refractory period? Let's go to four. Hmm, it's looking a little weaker. Okay, let's go to three. What is that? That doesn't look like an action potential to me. How about two? <laughs> That's lame. Okay. So, but what we have been able to do is look at the action potentials as evidence of when we go from a full action potential in sequence with a lot more juice to no action potential. So, where would you say that the cell is transitioning between the absolute refractory period to the relative refractory period? Remember, the peak at the far right was two. The peak here is three, and the peak at the left was four. So what you're going to do now is answer the questions in this section. So you want to record what is the reason for your results. Um, what is the effect of an increased stimulus strength for our second pulse? And how do you explain what is occurring here? Take a moment and record that, pause me for a minute, and then come back when you're ready. Okay, fabulous guys. So we have now navigated through the entire HH sim to look at both resting membrane potential ideas as well as action potential ideas. Remember, resting membrane potential, or the RMP, is there basically to look at changes in the membrane permeability. Does the membrane sit closer to threshold or further away from threshold? When we talk about people having fatigue or being lethargic, oftentimes that is actually just a change in their resting membrane potential. If you're feeling fatigued or lethargic, it may be that your cells are hyperpolarized and that it legit takes more energy to be able to get you to threshold and to be able to get things moving. For the action potentials, we were able to see that action potentials are all or none, meaning that whether I stimulate it 10 or 100, it doesn't really matter because once I hit threshold, the response of the cell is consistent all of the time. We also took a moment to look at the movement of sodium followed by the movement of potassium to really try to highlight that that depolarization phase of the action potential is related to sodium movement and sodium alone is creating those changes. And then on the downside of the action potential where we're looking at the repolarization of the cell, meaning the cell's becoming negative again, it's repolarizing. And the electrolyte responsible for that action is the potassium. So sodium's causing the up and potassium's causing the down. Potassium channels stay open longer than the sodium channels do. So we get this fabulous little after potential in place. And when the after potential is in place, it means that if the cell's going to be stimulated again, I have to have more energy. I have to overcome that threshold to create a new action potential. Those are the major concepts that you're going to be familiar with, both for your lab quiz, but also for ideas that are going to be represented on the final. So sort of a critical piece to our understanding of these two things. Resting membrane potential is not the same thing as an action potential. Resting membrane potential is the cell at rest, hanging out with a negative charge on the inside, where the action potential is where all the action is. This is where the cell is signaling the next cell where we're getting action potentials down the length. And if we tie it back into our muscle chapters, it's that action potential that creates changes on the inside of the cell, leading to calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to bind to troponin, rolling tropomyosin off the active sites of the active molecules, allowing myosin heads to bind. At a bing, we have cross bridge formation, and we can move and navigate into the cross bridge cycling form of muscle contraction. If you have any questions on this, please do send me out an email or two um, and let's see if we can clarify it. But hopefully you found this video useful. Whether you run through the program on your own or simply look at the data that's presented here is up to you. Hope you have a fabulous day and thanks for playing.